We're going to look at Psalm 137. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip open to that psalm. It's, uh, it's about grieving and grief. And I will admit right off the bat, I am not an expert in uh, grief or grieving. Uh, we have some great uh, ministries around here, one of which is a grief group, Pastor Connie Leeds. And so if you're interested in going deeper and learning a little bit more about uh, some of the things around grief and lament, uh, talk to Pastor Connie. Uh, there are situations that we face uh, where we are not able to move forward. We are not able to actually see the future that God has for us because we're stuck in a place of needing to grieve and we, we think that we've, you know, we've done the work that we needed to do and move, move, move along only to find out years later that we need to actually step backwards and we need to actually uh, enter those places that we probably should have entered a long time ago. So if you're struggling with some of those things of wondering, am I maybe uh, needing to do some work from something that's gone on in the past uh, before I can move forward, uh, talk to Pastor Connie and, and perhaps there's some things that even this morning. So, uh, so certainly uh, uh, this psalm directs uh, our, our attention to grief and there's probably a more exhaustive process that we could look at, uh, but this psalm is a, is a bit of a, a journey through from a place of, of, uh, of deep grief to a place of, of um, turning our attention to another place. Uh, let me give you a couple of updates before we, uh, before we move forward from here. Uh, come on out to our Wednesday night meeting, whether you're a member or whether you're a non-member and you're a regular attender, whether you're an active part of our congregation or you're just kind of uh, trying to feel your way in, come on out. Uh, it is a budget meeting, so we're, we're going to discuss and we're going to vote on a budget for the coming year, but it's also an opportunity to hear updates from me, uh, uh, from a pastoral perspective, from our ministry council chairperson. Uh, we will talk a bit about uh, the visioning process, and uh, for a number, of, a number of us on the pastoral team, we've been working at this for quite a long time. You as a congregation have had parts in it, and uh, I'd like to be able to share a few more things, perhaps. Uh, an identity and purpose statement to say uh, uh, how does this hit you and then and allow you to be able to give some, um, some of your own input by way of writing some things down so I might do a bit of an exercise that way come on out and uh, we can talk about identity and purpose. Uh, we'll give some staffing updates. We stopped our search for a pastor of youth and family and we want to give you an update in terms of what are we thinking where are we at right now uh, with that so come on out to hear that uh, and it will be good. Uh, another uh, quick update this past Friday Friday, I was at uh, Pastor Amos's house. Uh, so on Friday night, uh, Pastor Amos and Faith hosted all of the midweek uh, uh, kids and junior youth volunteers. And the uh, the Wilding Awards were handed out. I have one in my hand. Actually, I was a recipient uh, of uh, Jason McDougall, the guy in the box drum, and I both received a Wilding Award for the best musical ensemble. And uh, we were the only ensemble. The rest of the people were singular. So, uh, so we won that award. Award, we uh, would go and play some fun songs for the kids and junior youth, and that was our part. Uh, just by way of note, there were a few other categories. It's one of those strange things where uh, apparently the academy decides who wins, and the academy also decides what the what the uh, categories are for the year, and you don't quite know the category until you show up at the event. Uh, and I think I have a sneaky suspicion that the academy is Pastor Amos, but uh, but don't uh, don't don't quote me on that. Uh, the one award was uh, the award for sustained violence. Now remember, these are volunteers. These are not children and junior youth. These are the volunteers with the children and junior youth for midweek. And the guy who cuts the lawn for our church actually won that award. So, so be careful. And yes, it's not the person who gives out sustained violence. It's the recipient of the sustained violence. And that's Eric Cudney. Apparently he sustained a bit of a black eye in one of the midweek events. And so that's, that's where that came from. Alright, Psalm 137. If you haven't already turned there, I invite you to turn there, and uh, we'll talk about lamenting. And lament uh, simply is a process of grieving. It's learning how to grieve. And here's a bit of this, the overarching statement that uh, today's lament determine how tomorrow's look, how tomorrow looks. If we do a good job of grieving and lamenting around the small and the larger things, we're able to actually turn our attention to the future in a healthy way. If we don't, and our culture tends to be, by and large, one that doesn't grieve well, doesn't lament well, and if we think, I'll just kind of sideline that and I'll try not to think about it, but I won't actually enter the deeper places of grief, then I may find that my tomorrow doesn't look as bright as it could. I may find that I'm struggling to embrace my tomorrow, that God may have before me uh, as a result of not being 
being able to really go through the grieving process. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we can grieve a lot of things. Uh, we can grieve relationships. Uh, we can grieve uh, 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 both friendships. We can grieve spousal relationships. We can, we can grieve the kind of breakups. And we can grieve uh, the fact that, that people die and they're no longer with us in the present. And both of those are very important. Uh, we can grieve the loss of our health. Uh, we can grieve the loss of place, like home, uh, uh, our culture, our country, uh, all of these things. If we don't take the adequate time to be able to wrestle with, uh, I'm no longer in the place I used to be, and is that okay? And can I allow myself to feel really badly about that? And some of it is simply being able to go into those deeper, darker places that we don't really want to go, but they're important for us to go. And then they could be even uh, grieving the loss of the things that are valuable. For example, if you ever lost your wallet or your purse, you know that uh, that that kind of that sense of like, oh, like that feels a bit like there's a, there's stuff that I've lost that you know not only do I have to do a lot of legwork and and pay money and all of this kind of things, it feels a bit like it's kind of part of me, right? And you feel like uh, uh, I've got to let that go. It's just a small part of grief. I remember when I was younger, uh, in elementary school age, I don't remember exactly when. One Christmas, I got a remote controlled boat, and I was so excited to go use it. I went outside and I kind of chipped away the ice around around. I'd like to say it was a stream, but it was more like a sewer. I don't, I don't know what like it's anyways. Uh, it, just to try to try it out. And then when the spring came, our neighbors had a pond. And it was like this murky, muddy kind of the pond where you put your uh, hand in and you don't, you don't see past the, the point. It's all like mud and muck, uh, like that brown color. And uh, I remember my friend and I were out there and, and I was in a canoe and my friend had my remote control boat. He was controlling it and we were playing chicken. By the way, don't try this. Any of you that have remote control boats uh, and a canoe, don't, don't play chicken. Uh, because I ended up... Uh, hitting the remote control boat or he ended up hitting the canoe right depends on the perspective there and the the remote control boat sank into the goo and the slime and I never did see it again and I remember feeling the first thing I remember uh, feeling like what I was really upset I was really angry and I remember feeling like if only I or if only he, right? And I would repeat that. If only that had played it out differently, then I might still have that boat. And then I remember a, a season of just feeling really angry, just really upset that that, that happened. And, and I can't go down to the depths of that pond because it's, it's too deep and, it's, and, it, and, and it can't see anything. And that's all part of lament. It's, it's learning to let go. It's learning to say, uh, how do I move forward from here uh, to a new place? And really, the central part of it is perspective. That if there is no perspective shift, you will not be able to move forward. Okay, it's it's a it's a focusing. It's simply a refocusing. That's why uh, we go from today's lament, lamenting it and the loss to tomorrow. And if we can't actually look forward, uh, then we'll just be stuck there uh, for a long, long time. So we're going to talk about that. Um, but before we do, uh, let me pray, and then we'll, um, we'll st step into the text. Father, uh, thank you that you are well acquainted with grief and lament. And, oh God, I pray that whether people are struggling in the midst of something right now that they know they're, they're, they're wrestling with and, and trying to let go of, or whether there's people here that would perhaps say, wow, I, I wonder if I've been maybe not, I've been putting that off and I haven't been looking at it because it's too painful, but maybe I need to. Lord, wherever people are at, I pray that you would come and that you would um, wrap your loving arms around each individual. And, oh God, I pray that, that you would be that safe place that we all need in order to do the, the good work of, of looking at our lives, of looking at our present, of looking at the past, in order to be able to be open to the future. And so, oh God, I pray that you would speak by your Spirit. Jesus, I pray that, that you would change our minds where our minds are stuck right now, and that you would help us to take healthy steps forward as we wrestle with the grief that we now realize is in the present. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, here's some things to remember, and there, there's a bit of a step-by-step -step process that we see in this psalm, and uh, I'm taking a risk 
uh, in looking at this psalm because where we finished in the book of 2 Samuel, David was the king of Israel and politically, by and large, Israel was uh, one entity at this point. By the time this psalm comes along, Israel has fractured now and it's no longer one. There's Israel and Judah. Uh, one whole northern part of Israel has already basically been wiped out. They no longer exist by one nation. And now another nation has come in and taken the last bits of Israel and destroyed Jerusalem, leveled the temple, uh, completely destroyed, and taken away the people into Babylon. So they're living in a totally new culture. Uh, they're living uh, in, in, a, in a, a society that worships many gods that don't believe in the same God as Israel. And now Israel's going, well, what do we do now? What, what, what does this mean for us? And so that's where we find ourselves. And this is where it begins in Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. By the canals of Babylon, by the banks of Babylon, we see the people of Israel in a foreign land. They've been exiled. They are prisoners. They are no longer living in their land. Their land is decimated. And it says where we remembered Zion. We remembered Zion. We remembered Jerusalem. We remembered what was that's one of the first parts of the grief process is to recognize where are you, Babylon? Where do you want to be, Jerusalem? What does Jerusalem look like right now? It doesn't look like what I wanted it to be. And can I change it? Absolutely not. Unfortunately, I can't. That's the first, the first uh, part of it. Uh, realize the loss and face your powerless to change it. Fully grapple with the loss Take a good, long, hard look at destroyed Jerusalem. What you remember, whatever your Jerusalem is. And then take a good, long, hard look at where you are standing today on the banks of Babylon. Recognize where you are. So the psalmist begins by recognizing, I'm in Babylon. I'm standing on the banks. This is not Jerusalem. I'm remembering Jerusalem, but this is not it. Verse 2, there on the poplars, we hung up our harps. We can't worship now because we're no longer in Jerusalem. We're in Babylon. For there our captors asked us for songs. The Babylonians saying, hey, sing for us. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. And they said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Israel is wrestling with the fact that our institution of worship, that is the temple and that whole system that was set up by God, right? God set up the tabernacle. God said, this is how I want you to worship. God then uh, allowed them to build the temple under the reign of Solomon. And now all that's destroyed and we can't worship God anymore. We're not there anymore. You know what's fascinating? is that God had said, wherever you are, you are to be a light to the nations, to Abraham. He said, you will be a light to the nations. And here they are in another nation, wrestling with the fact that we can't be, and God would love to be able to say to them, yes, you can. I actually want you to be. In fact... If you don't do a good job of grieving the loss of Jerusalem, of admitting finally Jerusalem is not what it was and it actually never will be exactly what I remember it to be. And until we come to that place of admitting I cannot go back, I cannot change that, then we can't actually turn around and say, the people I'm living among are wanting worship songs. Do you get that? They can't hear their captors crying out for them to hear their songs of worship. They can't even have an evangelistic opportunity because they're fixated on the past. Do you see that? So what they're doing is they're seeing the torment of their current situation and they're longing for what they had back here. And God would be saying, can you imagine what I could do? They're asking you for songs of worship. Would you worship? No, we can't, because I want to go back to Jerusalem. Realize where you are. Recognize it. Celebrate all that it was. That's an important part. It's in this psalm for a reason, that we need to remember what that was. What is it for you? Is it a, is it a, a person? Is it a situation? Is it something of value that you once possessed? That you need to actually say, this is why it was so important to me. These are the memories that I have of that or that person. These are why it's so hard for me to let it go. Do that. Do that work. Sit down with someone that's, that, that loves you, that can just listen to you. Pour out your heart about that. 
uh, take a journal, start writing things down about what does that thing or that person, what, what do they mean to you? Write it down. Spend some time grieving, wrestling with what was that in the past and why was it so important to me? And then face the fact that you're powerless to change that. It's not what it was. It can't come back. You can't, you can't relive that. You can't whatever. You've got to be able to face that and recognize you can't change that. Until the day comes where we're able to say, okay, I think it can actually take a step away from that in order to see what may be in my present, what may be happening in the now. This happens at all kinds of levels. Let me give you an example. This past week, Sean and Elijah were on the trampoline together, and they started to get into a bit of a back and forth kind of fight. And I went out and said, look guys, you got to get it together. You got to sort it out. You've got to work together here, or you're not going to, I'm going to, you know, kick you off the trampoline, and I'm going to take away privilege. So I went back in, and I was doing some other things, and they were at it again. And I went out, and it's okay, you're both off the trampoline, and you both lose the privilege. And one responded, totally fine. Just, you know, went, went about, found something else to do, and it was fine. And the other responded in frustration. They ended up spending a bit of time in their room, uh, just cooling down, and then they came down and said, you know what, Dad, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said those things. I shouldn't have d- done what I was doing, and, uh, and I, I, I feel badly about it, and I, and I want you to forgive me, and I want to talk to my sibling and, and get their forgiveness as well. Wonderful. I said, hey, I love you regardless of whether you're doing good things or bad things. It sounds great. A couple minutes later, there was a request for that privilege to be reinstated. And I said, no. And guess what happened? Frustration returns. Why? Because they didn't do a good job of grieving the loss. Okay, do you see, see what's happening? When we do a really good job of grieving the loss of whatever it is, we're able to say, can I have that back? No, you can't. Okay, that's fine, right? Because I didn't expect it to come back. But the expectation was that if I'm actually good and I do all the good right things, that maybe it'll come back to me. Okay? Now, this idea can transfer into our relationship with God. That somehow there's something that happens that we're grieving the loss of perhaps, but we think that actually if we're a really good person, maybe it'll come back around to us, that God will actually give it, give it back to us. And you know what? Sometimes God does. But sometimes God doesn't. And that's where we get into the the challenge, right? If we do a really good job of grieving, if it doesn't come back, it's okay because we've actually done a good job of grieving and we've actually let it go. If we haven't done a good job and it doesn't come back around, guess what? We're going to get frustrated again. We're going to get angry. We're not able to deal with it, right? Because we're assuming that somehow our behavior has something to do with the fact that we don't really have to grieve because we may actually get this back around. No. Grief, part of grief is coming to the place of saying, I can't change that. I've got to let that go. And you know what? As soon as you're able to let that go and it doesn't come back and you're okay, and then imagine it does come back, it's a totally different, it's a totally different ball game. Okay? But if you've done a really good job of letting it go, then whether it comes back or not, whether that situation can replay itself. And when we're talking about the death of someone, those are the kinds of things that don't come back in this life. Okay? That's why it's really important for us to do that good work of really wrestling with that person is not coming back. And so what does that mean for me in light of that? Now, so that you don't uh, think of the idea that somehow there's this, there's, this, there's this works kind of system that God is this person who kind of doles out these, you know, you're you lose this privilege or whatever. The same thing can happen when we're on a long trip. As a family, we're on a long trip and we happen to be driving one direction and then we turn directions and we're on that road for a long time and the sun is beating through one side of the vehicle and not the other side. And so some of the passengers have to deal with this hot, hot sun and other people are very comfortable or the other people are very cold and the other, whatever it may be. It's not because of any punishment or reward or anything like that. It's just the way life goes. And the question is, what am I going to do about it? Okay? Am I going to reconcile the fact that this is not a very happy place to be, but I need to come to a place where I'm okay with it, or do I, can I figure out a way to, to block it out or whatever? Uh, but there are a variety of ways in which we can see that there are going to be situations where life does not go the way we want it to go. And we lose something that was really important to us. And we come to a place of saying, I, spent, I need to spend some time wrestling with all of what that meant to me. That person, that thing, that situation... 
And as I wrestle that through and I am able to celebrate all of those wonderful things in the past, then I bring them all into the present and say, okay, now I'm going to hold them and I'm going to give them to God and I'm going to give myself to God. And now I'm going to say, I don't have to forget, but I'm going to say, okay, God, it's okay. I'm going to be okay in the future and I'm ready to move forward. What opportunities are you going to have for me? And we're already now starting to transition into the next segment. First is, we're going to look at the situation. We're going to look at the fact that we've lost this, whatever it is, okay? We can't keep our eyes on that, right? Back to the, to the privilege and the trampoline thing, okay? I was able to say to the one that was having a really hard time with it, until you come to the place where you're able to get your eyes off the thing that you've lost onto something else, you are not going to be able to move forward, Okay? As soon as you can say, hmm, I don't need that privilege anymore. I'm going to do something else with my time. I'm going to figure out something else that I'm going to do with my evening. Then, ah, a whole new world awakens. But if I spend my time simply fixated on that thing that I have lost, I will never be able to see a whole new world because I'm fixated on what I have lost and how valuable that is or was to me. Which moves into the next part, uh, beginning in verse 4. How can we sing the songs of the Lord? Do you see that now? The, the, the turning of the attention away from the fact that Jerusalem is in shabbles and Babylon is our new home. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Now remember, for the Old Testament Israelites, Jerusalem was not only their, their place of, uh, of dwelling, it was the place of promise that God had said, I have delivered you out of Egypt, and I'm now bringing you into a place, a land of promise. That land represented relationship with God. Okay? So what they're really saying is, how can we be the people of God if we're not in the place that God has planted us? We can no longer really be the people of God, so we need to keep remembering the place that God has brought us to. Okay? Now, overarching, we don't live in that kind of uh, 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 way anymore. Uh, to follow Jesus is to follow Him regardless of where. The whole world we recognize as being God's. We are God's people wherever we go, and we're called to share the good news wherever we go in this world. So for us and for them, there's an interconnectedness between the place, for them, there's an interconnectedness between the place and the relationship with God. For us, it's a matter of focusing our attention not on the place, but on God, ultimately. God. Am I remembering God at every corner, at every place in my life? And that's the next, that's the next realization. That I move my attention from that place, that person, that situation, that uh, whatever it is that I'm grieving, to now I turn my attention to God. And I say, what is God up to? What is God doing? What does God want? Can I trust God? Some of us have to start in that place of saying, can I trust the God who has taken this away from me? Can I trust that God? Okay? And some of us, we say, no, I can't trust that God, and so I have to keep relying on my own ability to carry what's gone on in the past, my, my grief and my pain of loss. So for us, do you trust God? Are you able to get beyond that, to see that actually God might be doing something wholly new with you uh, if you're going to be able to trust Him? A couple of things to consider. Uh, do I only trust God when things are good? Am I only able to worship God when life is going well? I don't know if you've ever tried to pray when you're angry. Uh, uh, it's a very difficult thing unless you're able to say, God is, is okay with my anger and my frustration, and I'm going to share that with Him. Uh, but do I only trust Him when times are good? Or can I trust Him when things go wrong, when I'm dealing with loss? And the other part is, do I only trust God in the context of the worshiping community? Uh, for example, can I only worship when I'm at church or when I'm surrounded by church people? Or am I able to worship in a foreign land? Okay? Some of us feel like if I'm not in the context of a Christian community or people that are Christians, I can't worship. I'm in a foreign land. God, how can I do this? I'm not in Jerusalem. Okay? So what does it look like for us to be the people of God 
in whatever situation you find yourself in your workplace, in your neighborhood, where you recognize that people may not have faith in Jesus Christ? And can you worship there in the same way that you would worship in, quote-unquote, Jerusalem? Or are you finding yourself, you're not able to do that? So could you share stories of God's goodness and grace and, and a miraculous intervention or something that you've been praying for that, that, that you've seen actually an answer to prayer? Can you share that with your Christian friends, your, the friends who follow Jesus? Probably. Can you share those kind of things with somebody who doesn't follow Jesus? Or would you see that as being, ooh, I, I, you know, that might be an affront to their culture of values or, you know, they may not see it the same way as me? Well... We're sharing. It's like the Babylonian people crying out for, for the Israelites to sing their songs of praise. And we can't, we can't do that because uh, we're fixated on, on our, our grief and our loss. Remember God. Wherever you are, God is present with you. Sometimes when I come home, I'll come around the corner and uh, Erica will do this. <gasps> Because she didn't realize it came through the door. She didn't realize that I was at home. Maybe you, you do that uh, as well. Uh, maybe God does that to you. From time to time you're like, Oh, God's here. Uh, wow, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that, right? Uh, it's that idea of, yeah, God is with you wherever you go. And so don't be surprised. So when you're going through deep grief, if you're able to then turn your eyes to Him, and get a good long look at Jesus Christ. And, and watch Him draw you close. And listen to the words of the Scriptures that would remind you that He's got a plan. That He's got you in His hands. That there's nothing that you can't give over to Him that He won't take really good care of, better care than you. And so when it comes to your grief and pain, those are the best places to, uh, to give to Him. Trust the Promiser. Trust Jesus Look to Him, regardless of where you are. And we live in a society that it's difficult at times to trust. It's difficult to know, uh, can I trust this person? Can I trust this, this situation? Can I trust, trust this process? Can I trust this whatever it is? It's, it's difficult at times to trust. Uh, we can trust God. Last night it was, we were with some friends uh, camping and, and I just popped in. It wasn't very far away. I just popped in for the evening and, uh, and there was about six families that moved up to the Owen Sound area all at the same time. None of us had kids when we first moved up there uh, but we still keep in touch. And so once a year we, we try to do a little camp out. So I popped up for a little bit and uh, I asked to the circle, I asked, oh, does anybody have the time? What, what time is it? Uh, and two people, one person had a watch and another person had an iPhone and the iPhone person said 9.05 and the person the watch said oh it's 8.30 something and I was like whoa what's so I mean obviously which one's right right so I thought you know obviously you trust the iPhone and the the watch is wrong right I don't know if you've had that I've never had an iPhone and only to find out that the guy with the iPhone was lying <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so it's, it's part of this, sometimes we're, we're, we're like the mechanism, right? The, the, the structure, the whatever we think, I can trust that. Uh, I trust that, I don't trust that. And sometimes the people, uh, it's really hard to know who to trust. How do, you, how do you know which, you know, God is trustworthy. Uh, turn your attention not to the people. Uh, be confident, not necessarily in the process, in the system. Uh, be confident not so much in the people. Be confident ultimately in God. He will not let you down. He will not turn you astray. Thirdly, go on from here, and this is where it gets a little dark. Uh, it says this in verse 7, Remember, O Lord. Okay, so the psalmist has now directed their attention away from the situation they find themselves in to God, and now they're going to make a request of God. Okay? Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. What's happening here? The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Jacob and Esau were brothers. Uh, so they share the same heritage. But the Edomites were often at, at odds with the Israelites. And the Edomites, they dwelt up in the mountains. And so when Babylon came in to destroy Jerusalem, the Edomites were up on the mountains cheering on the Babylonians. Good Babylonians, destroy those Israelites. And Israel's saying, God, remember that. 
Remember the way that they taunted us. Remember those things that they said about us. It goes on then to talk about Babylon. Verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. He who seizes, and this is where it gets really gruesome, he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. The Israelites were actually crying out for the Edomites and the Babylonians to be cursed. Now, what is this? And I encourage you, don't pray prayers of cursing. Now, this is before the time of Jesus. And there's some things that changed in our perspective in the coming of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so what's happening here? Israel is praying the Deuteronomy prayer. I encourage you, go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy, Moses is telling Israel, look... If you obey God, God came in, He rescued you from Egypt, He delivered you, you are His now, He's called you, He's chosen you, live according to His ways. And if you do, He promises your fields and your crops and your livestock and the fruit of your womb will all be blessed. That your enemies will turn tail and run all of this if you're obedient to God. Okay. Now, if you're disobedient to God, and Israel's hearing not just their own disobedience, but the disobedience of the nations around them, if you're disobedient, then your fields will be corrupted, your, uh, the fruit of your womb will not, uh, uh, will not survive or they will not thrive, uh, that you actually will be defeated by your enemies. What's Israel doing? Israel's saying, God, we call on you as a faithful, trustworthy, covenant-keeping God to keep your covenant and curse them and bless us. That's what they're doing. Okay? They're remembering God's promises and they're praying them into the present and into the future saying, although we may be in this really bad state now, I am trusting that you are going to bring justice. Okay? You're going to bring justice in this situation. And in the coming of Jesus, we see the beginnings of justice. Okay? What we see Jesus doing is Jesus became the Israel that Israel was not. Jesus came and demonstrated God's power and God's life. And Jesus came to the cross and said, Now God demands justice. God demands death for sin. I will be that. I will be that perfect sacrifice. And those who find themselves in me are automatically known as the obedient ones. They are the ones who are in right relationship with the Father. And those who do not trust Jesus are the ones who are out of relationship. Those are the disobedient ones. And so Jesus came saying, look, I'm going to come again. And that's when you're going to see true justice accomplished. Okay? When I come back again, you will see the fullness of justice. But in this time, I want to give everybody an opportunity to do what Israel should have been doing all along, and that is drawing people into the care, into the covenant relationship with Almighty God. And in and through me, you have access to that one God. And if you choose to walk away from me, if you choose to live in disobedience to me, then you'll see me on the other side of justice, you'll see me when I return, and you will get a double portion of what you gave out on earth. Okay? And that's what we see, in, even in the New Testament. We see the same idea of, God, how, where is justice? Where are you, God? We're, we're in Babylon. What's going on? Can I trust you? Can I let go of that which I hold so dearly to and put it into your hands, knowing that you're actually going to take care of that? And where justice needs to be given, it's in your hands. It's not up to me to bring justice. I'm not playing God in this situation. It's up to God to bring justice. So we see in Galatians chapter 6, 7, the verse that goes like this. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. He who reap, you will reap what you sow. Okay? You sow death and sin and destruction. Guess what you're going to reap ultimately? Death and sin and destruction. You reap life you reap, uh, sorry, you, you sow life, you sow relationship with Jesus, you, sh you sow the kinds of things that Jesus called us to sow, and guess what you will reap? Life and the kinds of things that Jesus promised on the other side. We see in the very end of the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 6, there's Babylon once again, and this is God's address to Babylon saying, Give back to her what she has given 
Pay her back double for what she has done. The challenge that we have in the, in the present is letting go and giving to God the situations that we want to bring justice into. Instead of saying, I trust you, Jesus. You are the one who will ultimately bring about justice. And so for those who are crying out for justice, saying, God, where are you? Why are you not bringing justice into the situation? God will come and ultimately bring justice. If it doesn't happen in this life, it will happen in the end. And for those who are standing on the top of the pile giving out all kinds of things that are anything but good and life-giving and, 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 and uh, fruitful, like the fruit of the Spirit, they will see the scale tip wildly away from what they've been giving out. And that's what Jesus promises. So, in terms of our prayers, we don't pray prayers of cursing, right? Because Jesus is the model here. Remember, where is Jesus' attention when He's on the cross? Jesus isn't saying on the cross, Oh, it's not the synagogue. I can't worship. No. Jesus is saying, Father, he's directing his attention to God. In the moment of deep grief, Father, and then what is he saying? Forgive them. He's not praying prayers of cursing. He's saying, these people need a break. And I want to give them a break. Because next time around, there is no break for them. That this is their opportunity to get to know me. This is their opportunity to see the loving covenant relationship that God has extended to all people. And the next time around, so we don't pray the cursing end, right? We say, Lord, would you bless them? Because they're obviously going through things that I know nothing about and they need a blessing. And Would you bless them? And I'm going to give them into your hands and I want you to take care of them. And I don't want to have to think about that because you know what happens when I start to think about all that? I start to get angry and upset and frustrated. And I don't want to do that. I want to present it to you and say, God, it's in your hands. You know how I feel about this. And help me to redirect my attention to the things that you would want me to direct my attention to. So the third, uh, the third reality here is remember God's future. Remember God's future. God's got the future in his hands. And you don't have to worry about all the ways in which you're not getting justice or those people are doing that and those people need... You just focus on God. You just focus on letting go of the things that you need to let go of. And you move forward confidently into the future by being a person of blessing. Knowing that in the end, Deuteronomy 28, we'll see the fullness of Deuteronomy 28. 28 those who have trusted God will receive blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And those who have walked away from God, those who have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, will receive cursing upon cursing upon cursing. Worship team, you come. Let me finish with this, uh, this little story. It's some friends of ours. They have a six-year-old, and uh, I don't know how they found out, but they found out the six-year-old might have taken some cookies. And so they asked him, the mom asked him, did you take some cookies? And he admitted, he confessed, yeah, I did take. And she said, how many cookies did you take? And he did this. And she's like, five? And he's like, no. And she's like, four? No. One? No. Fourteen cookies. Okay? So already she's thinking, oh my, you probably have a stomach ache and all that. That's a lot of cookies. But the weird part was that he still had an appetite. He, like, he wanted to eat breakfast and he was good to go. And they were so confused by that. And then a couple days later, another child... But they punished him, right? They, you know, they... I don't know what exactly they did. And took away privileges or whatever they did. And a couple days later, one of the other siblings in the family found this bag of cookies behind... 14 cookies behind the bookshelf. Yeah, he was... So, here's the moral of the story. There's all kinds of... There's all kinds of probably psychological things that probably need to be assessed and examined and what's going on there. Okay? But here's, here's the part I, I think is significant. Is that he was able to deal with the punishment in the present knowing that there is a future hope. Okay? There's something... Something good if he can endure it in the present. Okay? So, for us, it's not that we're stashing things. For, it's actually believing that God has something in store for those who trust him. Right? And believe Believing that, yes, those who don't trust him also have something in store that doesn't look and taste like cookies, right? But that we can trust that God, that's in your hands. 
and I'm simply going to trust. I'm going to be obedient, and part of living in obedience is offering blessing where others are offering cursing upon us. Okay, so may you be a person who blesses. May you be a person who recognizes God's future looks really great for those who trust Him, and eternity is a much longer time than our life on earth. Why don't we stand, uh, and we're going to sing uh, about Christ and the cross. As we face seasons of loss, we begin by recognizing the loss and admitting we're powerless to change that, that we need to allow that to to be let go, uh, place it in the hands of God. And then we turn to God and we remember God, remember He's present, remember that He can trust our grief and pain, Uh, we can entrust that to Him. And then we remember His future and we look forward to what awaits those who are obedient in Him and we live lives of blessing in the face of wherever we are. So whatever your Babylon is, you're able to freely worship. You're able to freely be a blessing to the people around you that they may see the God that we serve and desire to know that God. Let's pray. Our Father, thank You that through times of grief and lament, it's the beginning of something brand new on the other side. Oh God, may we be able to turn our attention first and foremost to to recognizing what was lost, spending time grieving, spending time lamenting that in order to move into a season of turning our eyes upon you, fixing our eyes and our thoughts on Jesus so that Jesus, you can prepare us for our future. Oh God, may we not be people because we're stuck in our grief and lament. We're, We're the kind of people who become cursing kind of people. But, oh Lord, may we be blessing kind of people that offer our lives in your service. Thank you, God. Give us the strength and the courage to face the darkness in order to see you and lead, be led by you out into the light. Give strength to each person here. I pray for those that are wrestling in the midst of some grief, Lord, that you would care for them, comfort them, surround them in your love. Go before us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.